All right, hello, History 362. So today I want to talk about the later Seleucid dynasty, that is, after the death of Antiochus IV, um, who dies uh, while on campaign um, in, uh, in Elam, uh, probably an attempt, to, he, he goes east with a large army, and probably an attempt to kind of replicate the eastern anabasis of Antiochus the Great, um, of trying to sort of have an energetic royal campaign slash a journey um, to sort of reassert control, particularly over the eastern parts of the empire. Um, in that sense, it's going to be a grand failure because now Antiochus IV is dead. Now, he succeeded uh, by his young son, Antiochus V, still a child, um, and this uh, 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 child king is overseen by a powerful regent named Lysias. Um, who, amongst other things, uh, is in charge of the war with the uh, uh, Maccabees. Um, now, in 163, shortly after the death of Antiochus uh, IV, a Roman diplomat um, arrives in, in, uh, in Apamea, the big garrison uh, city of the Seleucids, and finds that the Seleucids have actually been violating the Treaty of Apamea, um, the treaty that had, that had ended the war with Rome in 188 BC, um, by maintaining still a large elephant herd um, and also a substantial number of warships um, that, are, uh, uh, that are sort of docked, um, uh, sort of mothball of warships. Um, and it's notable that the Romans up till now haven't been seemingly all that interested in um, enforcing this um, uh, a treaty, but all of a sudden now they are. And the Roman ambassador, a guy named Octavius, um, orders that the elephants be, uh, the ships be burned, which they are, and then the elephants be um, slaughtered by being hamstrung. Um, and this mutilation of the elephants uh, so bothers a kind of local citizen um, that he murders the Roman diplomat. Um, now, in any other time, uh, or in many instances, the murder of, a, of an ambassador or a diplomat um, can be a cause for war. And what's interesting is the Roman Senate seems completely uninterested in, in, in a, a war with the Seleucid Empire at this moment. Um, uh, uh, they sort of just ignore what could, in theory, be a, a substantial um, provocation. Um, now, um, uh, Dimitri, remember that one reason that Antiochus IV had been able to succeed in the first place is that um, the son of Seleucus IV, his predecessor, um, was held as a hostage in Rome. This is Demetrius. Um, and at this point, Demetrius, probably with the, um, again, uh, kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, the, 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 the slight, the, the kind of tacit understanding of certain members of the Roman elite, manages to escape from Rome um, and he sails back to um, he sails back to reclaim his kingdom um, and is indeed successful in doing so. Um, uh, Lysias, the regent, is overthrown, uh, and uh, the child king Antiochus V uh, seems to be liquidated. Um, now, Demetrius I uh, takes aggressive actions against the Maccabees. Um, it's it's uh, uh, him. Uh, he he managed to, to defeat. Uh, and uh, kill Judah Maccabee um, in battle. Um, uh, but um, uh, it, he becomes a power of 161, incidentally. Um, but he also has a uh, the problem of his own usurper. Remember, this has actually been a problem that seems uh, particularly uh, uh, endemic to the Seleucid Empire, where generals uh, have to be given large concentrations of troops that, and control sort of far off provinces. And it's very easy for them to all of a sudden simply say, well, I'm the king and uh, you know, my, my kingdom happens to be, at least right now, uh, the, the satrapies that I'm in charge of. We've seen this, for example, with Achaeus um, uh, under Antiochus the Great, who is sent to fight in Asia Minor, all of a sudden says, all of a sudden says well, I'm the king here at least. Um, and so for Demetrius I, the main, the general that, that rebels is a guy named Timarchus. Um, and Timarchus sets up shop in Babylonia uh, and, and controls uh, you know, chunks of Mesopotamia. Um, uh, Demetrius uh, 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 is ultimately successful in uh, his defeat. Um, but it's, it's, again, a sign of the kind of the, the centrifugal problems that the Seleucid Empire has. Um, 
Now, Demetrius I is subsequently overthrown himself in 150, overthrown and killed in, uh, in 150 BC by a pretender named Alexander Ballas, um, uh, who is uh, uh, promoted by um, uh, various generals and factions. Um, Alexander Ballas himself doesn't seem to be much of a particularly talented personality, he has the reputation sort of as a uh, cruel and luxurious figure. Um, but the, uh, the sort of promotion of this pretender to, the, to being king of the Seleucid Empire um, uh, ultimately leads to a complex civil war in which the Ptolemies get involved. Namely, um, Demetrius I had a son, Demetrius II, who after this kind of civil war and coup takes refuge on, in Crete. Um, uh, 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 Demetrius II uh, finally gathers up enough forces to return and try to challenge Alexander Ballas. And into this volatile situation enters Ptolemy VI, um, who actually is going to be one of the most energ militarily energetic Ptolemaic kings in a while. Um, he initially intervenes on behalf of Alexander Ballas. Um, at a certain point, he switches sides and decides that he's going to promote uh, uh, Demetrius. Although there also appears to be a point where he himself is crowned as king in Daphne, and he may actually seriously consider simply annexing big chunks of the Seleucid Empire. Although ultimately, uh, as, as, the, as the sort of uh, circumstances become clear, he decides he's simply going to support Demetrius II. Um, now, in a great battle outside of Antioch, um, Ptolemy himself is killed in battle, which, which certainly ends any sort of higher pretensions he may have towards Seleucid annexations. Um, Alexander Ballas is, however, defeated. Um, he flees, but is hunted down and killed shortly after. Um, indeed, supposedly the mortally wounded Ptolemy VI lived long enough to see the severed head of Alexander Ballas. Um, so this puts Demetrius II in power in 145, um, although he himself faces a similar problem, namely a pretender usurper who controls part of Seleucid territory, a guy named uh, Diodotus uh, Trufon, um, who is based in uh, what's now uh, Dora, Dor what's now Teldor in Israel. Um, <clears throat> more seriously, however, um, Demetrius II faces what will ultimately be a very, very existential um, uh, threat to the Seleucid Empire, and that is a Parthian invasion. Um, and, and here the Parthians, who have already been part of Seleucid history for about a century, but kind of a peripheral part, now emerge as um, perhaps, the, again, the fundamental existential threat to the Seleucid Empire. So remember the Parthians are um, nomads, steppe nomads, that kind of sweep into the Seleucid province of Parthia. They're actually initially called the Parni, and they kind of then take the name of the province that they occupy. Um, so this takes place in the, in the 240s BC, at, a, at a, at really a low point in Seleucid history, um, the Third Syrian War, followed by the war between the brothers. This allows the Parthians to therefore get this kind of foothold. Um, now, the Parthians had been, uh, had seen their, uh, the territory that they control constricted by the Anabasis of Antiochus the Great, um, but he hadn't been able to defeat them all the way. And indeed, his, uh, as part of his settlement on his Anabasis, um, he had ultimately allowed the Parthians to basically live in a kind of semi-autonomous fashion so long as they acknowledged the suzerainty of um, Antiochus and the other Seleucid, the subsequent Seleucid kings. Um, so the, tar the, tar the Parthians have therefore, you know, they've been there. Um, they seem to start being a little more aggressive in the 170s BC, um, but uh, in the 140s BC they go on an expansionary terror and occupy uh, large portions of Iran. Um, and in 141 they they capture Mesopotamia. Um, and uh, the, again, the Parthians, uh, as they sort of assemble uh, this growing empire. Um, aren't really like the kind of pretender usurper kings that have been a problem. And of course, it remain a problem for uh, Demetrius II. We've got we've got Diodorus Trufon, you know, hanging out um, uh, on the coast of, of what's now modern day Israel. Um, but the Parthians, because they have, uh, they you know, uh, most of these pretenders or usurpers are sort of Greco-Macedonians. Uh, sometimes can invent a kind of 
uh, I either have or invent a connection to the Seleucid royal uh, family. Um, the Parthians are an ethnic kingship, um, uh, and therefore this gives them a, both a, a, kind of, a kind of solidarity and a uniqueness as they start absorbing Seleucid territory. Um, they also are very, very good cavalrymen. Um, indeed, the Parthians are famous for their native skills as horse archers, um, and, and probably also you know, exhibit a number of other cavalry types, including uh, heavy uh, cataphracts. Um, so the fact that Parthians have really, really good cavalry um, is going to give them an advantage both in mobility and also just an advantage in fighting Seleucid armies. Um, so uh, Demetrius II, who's lost Mesopotamia, a critical part of, of Seleucid territory to the Parthians, goes east to fight them, and he is captured. Um, so now we actually have a Seleucid king who is a prisoner, held prisoner in the Parthian court. Um, and this leads to the rise of his brother, Antiochus VII uh, Cydetes, um, who comes to power in 138 and actually proves himself to be an extremely energetic, uh, militarily ambitious king in the mold of Antiochus the Great. Um, so he defeats Diodotus Trufon, the pretender, um, he uh, uh, brings the Jews in Jerusalem to heal, uh, possibly besieges and captures Jerusalem, but at the very least, they surrender to him. But he negotiates this surrender very well, in that while he, it seems he accepts a, a cash payment made out of the coffers of the temple by John Hyrcanus, uh, the, the high priest, uh, Maccabee, uh, the Hasmonean high priest, um, uh, he, uh, he nonetheless uh, comes to good terms with the Jews, and indeed, uh, a large contingent of Jewish soldiers will follow him on his campaign, his big campaign, which is to take back um, uh, 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 Mesopotamia uh, from the Parthians. Now, the Parthians, of course, realize that the Seleucid Empire is particularly vulnerable to civil war, I have one tactic they think might work. They said, what happens if we release Demetrius? We've been holding him in, in captivity for years. What happens is, as the army of uh, Antiochus uh, VII, Cydetes, as it, as it approaches, um, you know, what happens if we just say, oh, but you know, here's your brother the king. Which of you is king? No, oh, you're both king. Why, why don't you fight? Um, that actually doesn't pan out very well for the Parthians, um, but it, it, it shows that the fact that the Parthians think that would work um, shows uh, the problem of the a real kind of weakness in Seleucid um, dynastic dynamics. Um, unfortunately, uh, the way the, Parth the Parthians ultimately beat Antiochus VII, the, the old fashioned way, Antiochus supposedly has an extremely large army, um, the Parthians. Uh, engage and destroy that army in 129 BC. Antiochus VII falls fighting, um, and we are told that subsequently in Antioch there is a, 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 a terrible mourning, as almost every household has lost um, a, a soldier, presumably the, the Seleucid, uh, the call up of the Seleucid uh, uh, phalanx um, that has now been annihilated by the Parthians. Um, now, Demetrius II returns to what is now increasingly the rump of the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucids have now suffered massive territorial loss um, and really only control a narrow set of territories um, a, a, around uh, uh, Syria, um, at least control it directly. Um, and, uh, and indeed, I actually think I'm going to stop in 129 narrating the kind of blow by blow of Seleucid dynastic history. There will go on to be a whole series of Seleucid kings, but they are very petty in their territorial control. They are even pettier in their military ambition, and they are beset by ongoing dynastic strife, uh, uh, again, civil war, um, and uh, again, really, they kind of move towards being uh, this highly irrelevant, at best, local dynasty. Um, now, they are still around in 66 BC when the Roman general Pompey the Great, we're going to talk more about Pompey the Great, but he defeats a much, what at this point is a much more serious king, Mithridates VI of Pontus. Um, uh, it's notable that by the first century BC, Pontus, which for most of our story has been a kind of backwater, um, is now really powerful, and it's the Seleucids who don't matter at all. But anyway, uh, Pompey the, the Great defeats Mithridates VI, at this point a dangerous and powerful king, um, or who for a while is a dangerous and powerful king, um, and then Pompey decides that he's going to completely reorganize the East, 
Um, he uh, sweeps away the old Seleucid kingdom. Uh, the last Seleucid king is killed probably on his orders or on his behest. Um, and he annexes what is left of the, again, now much shrunken Seleucid kingdom as the Roman province of Syria. Um, so ultimately, um, uh, that little rump becomes part of the Roman Empire. Um, so as we think about the sort of Seleucid decline and fall, um, uh, it's, it, it may be worth just sort of thinking about, well, what are the dynamics in play? Um, the Seleucid Empire, uh, which of course, you know, really inherits the far-flung, multi-regional dynamics of the old Achaemenid Empire, um, has notably suffered the most from uh, sort of what I would just call centrifugal forces. The fact that territories just tend to spin away um, as local uh, dynasts, sometimes who start out as, as Seleucid uh, officials, are able to establish their own local kingdoms. And again, we've, we've, seen, we've seen this a lot. It happens in Pergamon. It happens in, uh, it happens in Parthia. Um, it happens in, in Bactria. It happens in, uh, in Judea with, the, with the, uh, the rise of the Hasmonean Jewish kingdom. All of these areas are once part of the Seleucid Empire, and then they, they go on to become subsequently independent kingdoms, in part because the Seleucid Empire is just big. It has a lot of different regions, and that's just something that you, you might say is, is, a, is a risk of being a big, far-flung territorial empire. It's also notable that, that it, and this is this odd strength, the Seleucids can suffer this kind of territorial loss and this kind of, 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 of uh, uh, secession and be fine, um, or at least continue to, to go on over time. I mean, these, these losses take place from the third into the second um, uh, and then down to the first century. Um, they, they suffer a lot of losses and continue to be at least pretty big players um, uh, in, uh, in the kind of uh, uh, Near East, Eastern Mediterranean, and across Mes Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau. Um, so on one hand, you might say the Seleucids do just fall victim to the, the this, this, again, the kind of centrifugal tendencies. Um, and as we've seen, there, there is this kind of, uh, you know, the Seleucids need to routinely raise up powerful, energetic, militarily competent kings to sort of piece the empire back together, to, to, to put the kingdom back together. People, you know, kings like Antiochus the Great, um, and they just can't produce those kings often enough. So there's that, that there is that problem that, that, that they don't just have that royal energy to deal with the kind of centrifugal energy, sorry, centrifugal entropy that the uh, uh, Seleucid uh, kingdom presents. Um, finally, I just think it's worth noting, if you also want to consider the big picture, the Seleucid kingdom is the victim of two of the hugely important empires of the future. Parthia from the east and Rome from the west. Um, these, these two empires are actually going to face off against each other into the third century AD when Parthia is replaced by a, a new Persian dynasty, the Sassanid Persians. But for all practical impact right, purposes, this basic configuration of Rome and, and Parthia slash eventually Persia is going to persist all the way up until the seventh century in the Arab conquest. So the Seleucids get squeezed out by these, this, 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 like dynamic that's going to determine, it's going to define the next, um, you know, 600 years of, of history. Um, and I, I would say both of these empires are in their own different ways, much more dynamic and much more powerful than the Seleucids, um, whether it's the dynamic of, of kind of the ethnic cohesion of excellent Parthian cavalry or the military uh, uh, manpower and, and dominance of the Roman Republic. The Seleucids just can't compete with that. And in fact, it's notable that, um, you know, whereas the Seleucids can kind of hold together their territory if they have a really energetic and militarily competent king, the most, some of the most energetic and militarily competent kings that they have, particularly Antiochus the Great and uh, Antiochus the Seventh, are defeated by either the Romans or the Parthians, that, that a militarily competent king isn't enough to withstand the greater power of, again, these two new and more dynamic empires. Um, so some, you know, again, ultimately the Seleucid Empire is, you know, there, we can kind of trace a decline and fall, but in, in many ways uh, it is simply uh, squeezed out by uh, you know, greater powers. Um, so uh, at any rate, that is, uh, that is the late Seleucid uh, 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 dynasty. 
um, does nonetheless hold out till, till uh, the 60s uh, BC, so about a century longer than the Antigonids. Um, next time, uh, we will talk a little bit about the Ptolemies um, and then consider uh, 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 Rome and the East into the first century BC. So we'll talk more soon.